let's get into the Dharma practice for today. Um, this is another layering practice, and it's also a linking practice. You'll see how it layers on um, I think, uh, aspects of uh, prajna, but you'll also see how it links again between mindfulness and more propositionally based processing. And so in a similar way, you'll find that it sort of resonates, and the pun is kind of intended uh, with Lectio Divina. So the point about chanting is we're going to be trying to do something that's more a little bit more musical. And why that matters is because music is one of the fundamental ways in which we play with how things are salient to us. And, and, and it's also how we play with the machinery by which we make sense of things, how things are intelligible to us. So it's getting it uh, to the root. Um, and chanting, because it is linguistic, of course, will engage the left hemisphere, uh, but because it's also musical, uh, pattern, open-ended, um, engages the right hemisphere, it's very conducive, um, <clears throat> as you can imagine, uh, for uh, increased insight, because insight is about uh, getting uh, a dynamic integration between the left and right hemispheres. Chanting is also important for what, what Winkleman calls neural, neural axial uh, integration. So this is integration from sort of the higher cortex areas uh, down to the basic areas of the brainstem. Music has that capacity to do that. Music has a capacity there because it's resonant uh, to integrate the inner and the outer. This is why we have this notion of enchanting something, doing magic, um, enchanting it, um, filling it with power or meaning. So there's a lot to bring to mind in your intention to chant. Uh, so the difficulty with chanting, this is, why, this is why I'm laying, why are you giving me all this theory? I'm laying all this in because, not because I want you to, oh, I want you to build a very um, sophisticated intent uh, for chanting. Because chanting, the, the, the besetting sin of chanting is to fall into sort of Bob. We just sort of, uh, 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 uh. Because you can do that. You can do that very easily. But if you remember everything you're trying to activate and access and accentuate with chanting, uh, then it'll go uh, much more transformatively for you. So it's very important that you have, let your stomach be open and belly breathing. It's also very important that you don't hyperventilate. Okay, so again, try to keep your breathing. Now, you're going to be breathing differently than you normally do because you're going to be taking in breaths and then using your out breath to chant. But make sure you're not getting that sense of, of a thinness to your breath and a lightheadedness. You don't want that. You should always feel uh, that you're well grounded. So, typically, uh, we won't do this right now, but typically, where I find chanting to sort of fit in best is I've done all my moving practices, all the Qi Kung, the Jan Zhang, the Chuan. I sat, I've done the seated Qi Kung, right? I've done the rooting, I've done the flow, and then I go into chanting. Then I go into chanting. So what you're going to do is you're going to inhale, and then as you exhale, you're going to chant. Now when you do, so the, in order to emphasize, for me, and I'm just going to introduce something to you. Again, it's an integrative practice, and it's designed to also bridge between the Eastern course that we're on and the Western course we're going to take up with, with the wisdom of Hypatia. So that's why I've chosen this one. Um, and it's also one that, for me, uh, it resonates with uh, the two sy symbols that I carry around. Um, so we're going to use, from the Eastern tradition, OM as one aspect of the chant, and from the Western tradition, one, because the one, the oneness of things, is right, sort of the epitome of the Neoplatonic uh, wisdom tradition. Om has to do with the grounding, the emergence, the flowing into existence of things. One has to do, of course, with the oneness of things, the oneness of things. Om is chanted lower, so it, it sounds like this. Om. 
And notice what I'm doing. So sort of my mouth is sort of rounding. Uh, sometimes OM is actually spelled A-U-M, AUM. And you want a bit of that rounding in your mouth, AUM. And you don't want the chant to end with your mouth coming closed, right? If that's halfway through the chant, so it's um, so I take a breath, um, and see, I, I, I'm, uh, uh, I'm rounding to closure. Sorry, I have to talk and interrupt the chant. I, I can't, uh, I need a hand puppet or something over here chanting while I'm talking or something. But anyways, right, when I get here, I want to continue on with the mm, mm. So the ah uh, part is out, right? And then the mm is in. And you want to feel the vibration in your chest and your abdomen as much as you can. And you're trying to get it's it's like the vipassana. It's like it's like the it's like the centering and the grounding. It's very energetic, but it's very much like getting that's why it's a deeper note. Mm, it takes you down into the depths, right? It takes you down right to the Tao, where everything emerges from, flows from. Then and in breath, and one is higher because right, this is supposed to pick up on the. I notice how everything is an enacted image. Everything is it's symbolic because this is like the ascent. We're going to learn about the anagoge that's central to the Western tradition, and so this one's higher. One, and when when I when I'm pronouncing the end, I try to feel. I try to feel sort of how I try to feel. All at once, the oneness of everything, and how everything is one. That N is like the pronouncing, pronouncing of everything's determination. See, there's a lot happening. There's a lot happening. So one cycle would look like this. So I inhale. Um, one. What I tend to notice when I do this is that my own tends to get deeper also. I mean, like in pitch as I get further into the practice and the one gets a little bit higher. And what you also, and you can feel the prajna. So although prajna tends to me to be more in and out, this is also not in, not just in and out, it's up and down. So you've got the emergence from ohm and the emanation from one, if you want to think about it that way. So there's this uh, creative tension the Greek word is tonos. Right? And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to enact in the chanting, you're trying to enact sort of the fundamental grammar of being. You're trying to enact it symbolically, but it's not just a symbol that refers. You're enacting it. It's a symbol that participates. And that's where you get the transformation. Now, because you're doing something that has this conceptual aspect to it and has this linguistic aspect, you can see how it's bridging into the propositional, but the musical, the coordination with the music, the coordination with the breath, the rhythm, the the, the, the actual way um, your metabolic energy is being aroused, all of that is also moving it into the participatory. And of course, the, the up, down, and the in, out is transforming the perspectival mode. So all of this, you're trying to do this, and I'll, I'll review this again with you on Wednesday and Friday. You're trying to do all of this enchanting. Try not, try not to have chanting just be, there's other things you can be doing, like uh, other things you can chant with. I'm just giving you an example. And I'm, I'm trying to give you one that will fit the course. That's why I've chosen this one. It's also the one I, I, I tend to prefer in practice. Because like I say, it will bridge between um, the, the Eastern traditions we've been uh, making most use of right now, uh, Buddhism and Taoism and it will bridge into uh, the Neoplatonic tradition, which is, uh, uh, as Ver Verse Lewis argues, it's, it's the spiritual grammar uh, of the West. Okay, so uh, how is that for everybody? I, I hope that makes sense. I'll, I'll do it one more time, all right? So in breath. Oh. One. And throughout, right? And this is part of the, I'm feeling the flow in my body. I'm not losing my flow. I'm not losing my root. And I, this is really important. I'm feeling 
Again, what's the tenor of my mind? Is it getting thin and wispy and starting to race? Or is it feeling rich and rooted? If it's rich and rooted, I'm chanting well. If it's getting thin and wispy, I'm starting to hyperventilate and spin off. Or if it's getting dull and sort of closing in, then I'm falling into sort of the, just a, a rhythmic, like a, almost like a lullaby and lulling myself, lullaby, lulling, lulling myself uh, towards sleep. So you don't want the lulling and you don't want the wispiness. You want that sort of rich rootedness, right? And, 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 and you know, for those of you who can sing well, you, you want that sort of that rich tonality uh, to be a way of embodying uh, that richness. Try not to think of this as a musical performance, even though there is a lot of music going on. My hope is that we can figure out some way in which we can do this and we can hear each other, we can do it collectively, uh, because uh, that then brings out the final dimension that um, chanting uh, brings to it, which is the deep integration between individual and the group. Uh, because what happens when you're chanting, um, especially when you don't try and make it a musical performance, um, is that the various chants take on a life of their own and start to spontaneously harmonize with each other. It's, it, it, that's if people don't really try to do it. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, so what I recommend we'll do is the following. Um, I recommend we what we'll do is the following i'm going to do the moving qigong exercise just to act as a bit 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 of a bridge right and then do the open and closing uh, motion that i've taught you then there'll be silence for a bit right as you find your center find your root find your flow find your focus then i i'm, I'm sorry i'll interrupt and we'll chant for a bit and then we'll go when then we'll go into whatever uh silent practice you want to engage in, okay? All right, so let's set the timer, begin. Briefly review one more time. We've been doing it all week. And it's now a continual part of the practice. What's going on in the chanting. And then we'll set the timer. Uh, I'll chant. We'll chant. Hopefully you're chanting with me. Um, and then we'll go into the silent sit. And then we'll have some time for Q&As. So let's remember that we're trying to make this as much a whole body experience when we're chanting. Uh, you should be uh, trying to feel, you, you know what it's like to feel music in your body, right? There's obviously a physical aspect in which you're feeling music, but there's also the psychological aspect in which you, you're catching the rhythm, you're, you're picking up on the cadence, right? And so you want to be feeling it in your body um, in both the psychological and the physiological sense. Um, and it's, so it's important, for example, when you're doing the ohm, right, that there's the deep resonance and, you, and what you're feeling, you're feeling it both psychologically and physiologically, 
and it's that deep resonance, and then you're you're feeling the grounding, and right that that's the sort of uh, embodied aspect of it, the embedded aspect, and then deeper the ontological. It's an enacted symbol for how everything is emerging from the ground of being. It tends to put an emphasis, therefore, on Eastern philosophy. Because when we do the one. And you're trying to resonate, you're trying to pick up on the oneness of all things. It's a higher note. And that, that, in that sense, it's enacting the anagoge. And then it, what you're trying to feel there is right that oneness and how it's the overarching logos, the overarching principle or source of principle uh, from which everything emanates. So you're getting the emergence from the own and the emanation. Uh, from the one. Of course, these are metaphors, and they should be understood as that through which we are ascending with our attention, not anything we are grasping in any kind of uh, comprehensive cognition. So, as I've said, I think Lexio Divina, just to also principles of designing an ecology of practice, Lexio Divina and chanting have a complementary relationship. So uh, I, see, I see chanting as taking us from the linguistic conceptual into the depths of mindful awareness and attention. And then I see Lexio as helping to bridge out of mindfulness practice uh, into uh, uh, a, a propositional, symbolic, but ultimately also poesis, poetic uh, mode of cognition. So I hope I hope that was a helpful review. And please set your uh, your phones on do not disturb. Get yourself in your basic position, and we will begin when I say begin. Begin. Oh, one. Please begin your silent practice. 